came to mind around this exhibition and, and your work mm -hmm. uh, was the sense of connection that I felt uh, to the land that your main character had um, in your opera. Yes, yeah. Well, I've been intrigued for the longest time about the idea of a picture. You know, I was born and raised in Stockton, and you know, part of what made Stockton so important, sort of, in terms of agriculture, in terms of California history, in terms of the country, is that it has some of the richest soil, farming soil, in the world. Originally, the San Joaquin Valley and around Stockton, it was swampland. And what changed is when uh, a Japanese immigrant, you know, a guy named a fellow named Togoshima, arrived in the late teens and twenties and looked out on this land in the Delta and said, I'm going to farm it. And so the, all the locals and the local business people laughed at him, as is always the case. And I wrote about him, and he kind of is embodied in my character, the idea that he saw something, the new immigrant, he dreamed, and he also was willing to work his butt off. And so he came in to Fukushima and brought in some new technology, he hired other people who are willing to do the hard work, mm -hmm. and they literally took that whole swampland of the San Joaquin Valley and they drained it. Mm -hmm. And after they drained it, it became some of the richest farm soil mm -hmm. in California and in the United States, and he began to exploit it and raise mm -hmm. potatoes. Mm -hmm. So in my play, in my opera, the idea that potatoes, he drives his fist into the soil mm -hmm. and upspring potatoes, bountiful potatoes that mm -hmm. just spring up and that it feeds basically a country that's about to enter into the depression. And so because of that, uh, the country needed potatoes. He was smart enough to realize that and change sort of the landscape of agriculture, sold it and became quite wealthy and powerful. And so that was sort of the establishment of the whole agricultural truck farming community where the Japanese Americans were part of. And that ultimately, one of the theories about, you know, after, during World War II and the whole incarceration of Japanese Americans is leading up with anti-Japanese sentiment was this feeling of, you know what, Japs are like running the economy, this is the richest farmland in the country, if not the world, and we want it back. And it provided a really opportune time for politicians to push the whole internment camp. Part of the reasoning, part of the reason behind it was that it was also a way to get Japanese Americans out of sort of the farming uh, industry there, take them out, and it could be taken over. And so for me, the peat dirt itself, this really rich soil, is thousands of years of uh, tulies that have lived and died, lived and died, died, kind of died on top of each other, layer upon layer of dead tulies. You know, and in a sense, history and generations that created this wonderfully rich soil. So I use peat dirt as a kind of metaphor for the idea of history. In one hand, he has peat dirt that is rich and has so much history and it's kind of allowed, you know, me and my people and my community to prosper, yet we were betrayed. And so he sent to Roar, Arkansas internment camp, takes that soil from that betrayal brings it back to Stockton and he mixes the soil together and the idea is what will it grow? In the play also telegraphs up to the 21st century the idea also is that what will it grow has to do with what is happening now in terms of the promise and taking all of that and making it part of the soil that all goes into the soil and the idea is what will it grow? My character asks in the end what does the soil grow? It can grow vegetables, but it also grows Executive Order 9066. It also grows the kind of hate that we have now and betrayal. When all things are considered, the arc of the universe just bends and it's up to people to decide ultimately what will it grow. That's a beautiful image, the, the Peter. Mm -hmm. People talk about the American dream and you come here but it exacts the price and it's like the internment camps are part of that price racism is part of that price discrimination is part of that price and now it's more evident than ever that the price of admission to this country is you could be locked up you could be separated from your children you know and in the end it almost begins begs the question as to is it worth it what, what do you have to give up you have to put up with sort of having your gas station 
you know, burned down. Like my, my sick friend talks about how growing up, you know, part of the price of admission is you learn to live with people shouting stuff at you. You know, again, that's the price of admission. And is that worth it in the end? Or that is what the new America, new American is, is an embodiment of all those things, understanding those things, and then making the choices as to what is, what is my next step in terms of how I live, how I help to steward the country, how I help us maybe, as artists redefine this country in terms of what will it grow. You know, I, I, one of my students wrote this. He's a, a, a Latino ex-student. He's talking about how his own parents came and are, were, quote, undocumented. And the idea, wouldn't you lie, like stay here, overstay your visa, if the price was that your family would be killed? So it's the idea of, that's the price you're at. I'm asked. My family was asked, and they said, yes, we will lie to stay here because the price is to go back and die in, in Latin America somewhere. So, you know, again, to appreciate the stakes of these questions that we ask of our, you know, with me and the students and their parents, it so, becomes so real you know, when you hear that, and it, it sort of makes you look at immigration differently. What do you hope people will get out of your opera? You know, the audiences that will come in are part of all people who already think and feel the way I do. I make no bones about in terms of the issues that are raised. But it's rather that it is presented in an artful and tech storytelling way that is new, fresh, that allows us to see the material in a raw, new way that can sort of awaken the fire of, oh yes, that is wrong. Oh yes, it has impact now. Oh yes, I remember this fire I have about when things are wrong, I get up off my butt and I speak out. If I can, you know, if the piece awakens that, that's what I hope for, you know. It's, again, everyone knows sort of what's going on and to show them history can repeat itself in the most awful way and that we have to really stand up, be, get impassioned, get fiery, get worked up and shout. And the play, hopefully, the musical, the opera, the opera can do that. And with this uh, mm -hmm. event, yeah. uh, you're going to read a piece from Pool of Unknown Wonders. Pool of Unknown Wonders, yeah. And it, you know, it's appropriate in terms of our conversation, the idea about there is a character in Pool of Unknown Wonders, one character as a group that's on the journey kind of seeking sort of the answer to what this country is. And this particular character is a... Uh, a white, young white male who represents a point of view of the, you know, the white male who is the new, the new right, the new nationalist. Uh, and he, the point of what I was doing was to make him as impassioned, as articulate, articulate as possible so that you hear what he's saying, you understand his own personal justification, and that is scary because he can justify it and it makes sense within his limited kind of his world in context. So that's what I'm going to read. One of the things that come up, comes up is the realization that I can see why young white males or white males buy into this. Because some of the things it deals with, like mm -hmm. being, being you know, unjustly treated, you know, taking away one's rights, being overlooked by other people who haven't earned it, are such sort of like basic kind of emotional feelings that it's scary how when you hear the arguments articulated, it makes you well up and go, yeah, well, of course. And that to me is scary in that it's why when I look out and I see the faces of some of these people with their tiki torches, okay, these are people that I, I think I know. They're in a different context and they're expressing different ideas. But these are college educated, you know, middle class, upper middle class men. And now, you know, to know that they can buy into these things as I write the words for my character, is frightening and that it seems to catch, be catching on, you know. And so that to me, just to see a segment of America pushing in that direction, moving in that direction, should, ter should terrify all of us. What kind of dialogue do you hope to inspire? Well, the way it works is if you really believe as an audience member that this person believes and is making actually in his own mind, in his own kind of point of view and context, mm -hmm a good argument. And to hear somebody argue that articulately and strongly, for me the audience should be both going, this is really offensive and yet I understand 
And it's scary that there are people like this alive with hearts beating that are out in America now and, and they look like people you could be going to school with, you work with, uh, and, and they're carrying within their hearts and their minds these ideas which are utterly at sort of at odds with how we view justice, America, and uh, in relationships with other communities and cultures and races that they're working against it. That's scary. To me, that should, that should be scary and that should be offensive, you know. And I hope, we, hope hopefully the audience responds in a way that isn't just, oh, go, go away, as opposed to, oh, is this, is a, this is a piece of literature and a theater piece that shows us a character who believes this, and let's watch him make his argument, and how do we feel about him after he makes his argument? We'll see. Thank you. Thank you.